Well, hello there. Welcome. Welcome to my channel. Today is a bit of a different session uh, compared to the regular uh, sessions I have. Normally I'm doing some live coding, but today is the first day of the Global Azure, the virtual Global Azure uh, well, event. So I'm doing a, a small session uh, over here. Uh, I'll repeat it tomorrow uh, at 11 o'clock my time, 11 a.m. It's now 1500 p or it's 1500 3 p.m. Uh, at, at the moment uh, so good morning good afternoon good evening wherever you are uh, thanks for joining uh, and today i'll be uh, talking a bit about what i've did in my past uh, coding sessions uh, here on twitch is securing my uh, well securing my backend services uh, so let's get started. Uh, we have a lot to cover this, uh, this afternoon uh, and uh, if you have any questions feel free to put them in chat or if you have any suggestions on what I should improve in the overall architecture or overall solution let me know also uh, and I'll be able to adjust it for the viewers tomorrow because tomorrow will be awesome also. Thank you. So uh, for the people uh, who don't know me, who, who are new uh, to my channel, I'm uh, Jan de Vries. I'm a cloud solution architect at a, at a company called uh, 4.net, uh, based in the Netherlands. It's a small consulting firm. We have about 50 to 60 people uh, in, in the company. And what we do is, well, it's in the name, we're doing .NET solutions. Uh, I'm focusing on Azure solutions myself. Uh, uh, which means migrating from on-premises to Azure or expanding the overall Azure architecture or reviewing what they have in Azure and how they can or should improve this. I'm also a, a Microsoft MVP in the Azure space, uh, which is awesome. Uh, so uh, thank you for that, Microsoft. <laughs> so let's, let's get started. As I mentioned, uh, we're going to cover on um, how to use managed identities uh, to authenticate your service to backend services. So let's get to it because, well, the, the main thing. Let's close this screen. So uh, what you what you probably start with when doing a project or a migration to to Azure is thinking about, well, how to design this overall solution. Um, uh, but how should you start with it? I have to confess, most of the time I'm going through a list of the new and shiny services in Azure and see which one fits the best or could fit uh, the best or which sounds appealing to me and see if I can fit it in the overall well, solution. This isn't a very good practice and well, it's, it's something you have to learn and learn how to hold back because there are new services introduced, well, all the time in Azure, as you might know. And, well, picking the newest and shiniest isn't always the best option. So what should you think about when designing your solution, uh, be it from on-premises to the cloud or expanding the cloud architecture? Well, you should think about a couple of things uh, like the time to market do they want to deploy the stuff well next week well maybe if you have to deploy it next week or within a uh, well short amount of time let's stick with the proven technology and let's stick with the stuff the the team and the company is familiar with so also team knowledge is uh, an expen is an important consideration to take into account but also the maintainability you don't want to have, well, 30 or 40 or 50 different services in your solution. Well, maybe you do, but uh, it will become, well, if, if, you, if you don't manage it properly, it will become a big mess. So it's hard to maintain. It will probably be loosely coupled, but still hard to maintain. Something I see happening a lot these days uh, when going microservices. Uh, so you have to take this into consideration. Availability also important. Uh, you want to have services with an SLA or maybe without, without or how, how high is the SLA? 
I don't know, uh, might be important for you. And there's a, a lot of other stuff you have to take into consideration when designing the solution. But today, I want to talk a bit about uh, the, the security aspect of, of your, your solution, uh, because this is important and it's something I see a lot of customers aren't quite on par uh, with this, either with the implementation or with the team knowledge uh, of the developers or the operations people or, well, the, the DevOps people. Either way, this is important and should be high on the list on, on well, every solution you, you make because uh, we're in a public cloud. And that's also what I tell a lot of those customers. Uh, when I see such a kind of design, because, uh, well, this is a bit of uh, the, the, the microservices I, I see happen a lot. We have an app service and another app service and another, uh, another few app services because they're doing only one thing and they're doing it right and they're isolated and stuff like this. <laughs> well, I'm not quite happy with this kind of design because it's, well, this is a distributed ball of moth. You can look it up on, on Wikipedia. Uh, it's, it's an actual thing because what you have now, instead of having classes calling other classes in, in, your, in your own, well, uh, process, now you have services calling services over HTTP, uh, which is, well, slower compared to having multiple objects in, in memory. Uh, so this is not something I'm very happy with, but it's something I see designed and implemented a lot uh, for the customers I'm helping and consulting with. So, but then they show me this picture if they have a picture. And well, first thing I say is I'm not happy with this, with this design. And then have you thought, do you do know Azure is a public cloud, right? So if you haven't done something to secure your services, everyone will be able to connect to it. And if I'm lucky, they're not mind blown when, I, when I'm telling them this. Uh, if, if I'm lucky, and most of the time I am, they, they come up with a list stating, yeah, we secured our services with IP whitelisting. We have a secret code which you have to implement in the HTTP header in order to, well, for the request to be uh, processed. Self-signed certificates, which is great. Self-signed certificates, great. Uh, it's an easy way to, to well, uh, kind of secure your uh, requests. Uh, it's also, if I'm not mistaken, one of the proposed solutions to secure your services until, uh, well, uh, uh, some some time ago, or at least maybe it's still a good practice, but there are better practices in my opinion nowadays. Um, and if I'm lucky, there are some operations people inside the organization who have, well, ex uh, some experience with creating virtual networks and some network security uh, groups uh, on top of it. Uh, which is great to isolate your services inside a specific VNet and have an MSG well in front of it to uh, tell this service can access it, this one can't, stuff like this. This is great. And then we have this, this new private link. It went preview last year for a couple of services. Past couple of months, some new services were uh, introduced or private link compatibility was introduced. I think App Services and Cosmos DB were the latest in preview or GA. I don't keep, keep track of it all, but this, that's great to isolate your services. So when using VNets or private link, you can make sure, or not or, and VNet and private link, you can make sure your services aren't exposed to the, well, to the public and only to services or, or audiences who should be able to connect to it. But that's, that's, a, that's a network infrastructure thingy. And I'm a d developer 
so that's not my experience my my cup of tea i know enough of it to be dangerous so the secret code obviously is it's not a very good practice to use this because it's security by obscurity and ip whitelisting is well meh it's it works for dev and test environments but you probably don't want this in production right so what can you do well something i've been doing uh, a lot uh, lately is using menace identities using menace identities to authorize requests to the backend services so most of the time we have some front-end service uh, which users or spas connect to and this this front-end service this this well front-end web api or backend for front-end whatever you want to call it has to connect to dozens of other services to retrieve or to update or to delete data and you can use managed identities for this because this app service this 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 API in, in the front of your solution can have an identity in, inside your Azure environment. Uh, Managed identities are, well, uh, known stuff. They're, they've been here for, I think, three years now, something like that. So it's, it's not new. It's just most of the time you use it to connect to Azure services like Keyfold. Uh, if you're using Keyfold to store secrets or, or certificates or uh, whatever, uh, you're probably using the managed identity uh, of your app service to, or Logic App or whatever, uh, to retrieve those secrets and use them inside your application. And that's great. It also works for Service Bus and a lot of other services in Azure. You can look it up in the documentation. It's not something I'm gonna cover today. However, what a lot of people don't know is you can also use these managed identities to authenticate with your own services. So as I as I've shown you in the earlier diagram, uh, we have a couple of services, app services connected to each other uh, via HTTP calls, and it's you can add an authorization header inside your HTTP request with the JWT token of a managed identity. And the backend service has to validate this. That's quite easy to do if you know how. It has taken me, well, a couple of hours to figure out. Uh, but afterwards, it's like, why haven't I done this before? It's easy and more secure as a secret code inside your header. And also using the, the default security authorization flows. So how, how does this Managed identity stuff look like? Well, I've, I've picked a, a nice image from the Azure documentation site, and this is how it works. And you can forget about it right away because this is just, just a regular uh, flow uh, to get, uh, to get a, a token and uh, pushing the token to the service you're requesting authorization for. and um, a response will come back, either valid or invalid, or either authorized or unauthorized. Uh, so it's it's a game of well, uh, it's it's much like the the regular OAuth uh, flows. So next up, so how do you create such a managed identity? Well, it's it's not that hard. We're probably using ARM templates already. So if you if you are using ARM templates uh, for an app service, for example, you can add, a new pr add the property identity to it with the type system assigned, and it will create an identity in the Active Directory for you, for your app service. I'm talking about app services right now, but it also works for other services which a managed identity support. So adding the system assigned, uh, you can also do it via the portal, of course. So head into the portal, go to the identity blade of your app service, and 
check the status to on. Identity will be created and you will see the object ID of this identity inside, uh, inside the portal. So this object ID is important. Uh, you can uh, note it over, over here and uh, save it in, in some, well, uh, notepad or OneNote or whatever, because you're going to need it later on. You can also look it up in Azure uh, later on inside the AAD. Uh, so this isn't the only place you, you will be able to see it. It's just, well, it has been created over here. So let's copy it. <clears throat> As I mentioned, you can also check it out in the enterprise applications of your uh, Azure environment. I'll, I'll show you for the people who don't believe me, and I photoshopped this uh, this image. It's uh, right over here inside the uh, enterprise applications. Let me check it out. This is the app registration. So here's the enterprise application in my Active Directory. So, and this is the backend service uh, I'm going to add authorization to. So I have, uh, for my solution, I have a couple of services. Uh, one front-end service, which will invoke two other services with an authorization header, of course. So this is the secure API dash speakers service, uh, which will get some authorization on top of it. To make it a bit more clear, let me also show you Visual Studio before we proceed, so you can make a kind of a mental model. So over here is the solution. Let me zoom in a bit. So as I mentioned, this is a, this is our front end uh, API, so users or Nightingale, Postman can connect to this one. And what it will do is invoke the other services to retrieve data. So for today, we're going to use the Secure API Speaker project, which has some authorization uh, uh, configured on it, and we'll get some data from it. I'll come back to this later on, uh, so stay tuned. <coughs> and also in the AAD, I will be doing some configuration or show you the configuration of this uh, secure API dot speaker uh, project. Cool. So back to the slide deck. Um, so and now, that, now that you have this managed identity in inside your AD and configured uh, to to your uh, application, uh, it's it's connected to your application you will be able to do some of uh, this code. So what this does, let me pick a, a laser pointer because pointing with my finger doesn't work when, when sitting in front of a camera. So first of all, you have to specify uh, the tenant ID and uh, uh, what's this? Yeah, and the application ID, URI, uh, for which you want to get a, a token for. So I'm using the Azure Service Token Provider. You probably know this uh, already for well getting a token for the default Azure Services. Uh, it's the same Azure Service Token Provider. I'm just using instead of the the key vault uh, callback, I get uh, get a key vault callback uh, uh, helper method or the the, the default uh, uh, Azure uh, Azure URLs. I'm using my application ID, URI, and a tenant to retrieve an access token. Uh, so the, the application ID, URI, is new over here. Normally, you'll put something uh, there like a service bus dot namespace slash yada yada yada. For connecting or authorizing against your own services, you need to specify the applica application ID URI. So this is a bit different. Well, it's, it's similar, but it, it looks a bit different inside your code. I'll show you this uh, in, a, in a couple of minutes. Because this is just the 
secure API, that speaker, uh, that API code you have to do when uh, making an authorized request. We can, we can also see it over here. Uh, I'm creating an HTTP client and adding the authorization header to this to the request and sending a request. So this code can be made a bit better, obviously, but it, it works. It's good enough for demo code. It's clear to understand, in my opinion. If you don't agree, let me know. So that's, that's this part, and this is the easiest part because creating a managed identity is just three lines of JSON where two of them are braces. Uh, and this, this piece of code is something you've probably typed or copy pasted uh, a dozen times already. So this is rather easy to understand. Or at least if, you, if, if you're familiar with, with this, uh, this stuff. But this, well, like I mentioned, is easy stuff. Uh, what we need to do is add or configure the authorization on our uh, backend services. And in order to do this, you have to do some stuff inside Azure Active Directory, which isn't very obvious, or at least wasn't very obvious to me. And I still think the user experience for this can be made or should be made uh, a bit easier. I don't know if it's, the, if it's on the roadmap or somewhere on the backlog of the team. Uh, it works now. Uh, you have, just have to do some, well, obscure stuff in my opinion. But let me show you and you can, well, have an opinion of your own. So first thing you need to do is create a new app registration for the service you want to add authorization to. So I've done this already also, uh, and I'll show you in the Azure portal in a bit. But what it comes down to is creating an app registration and configuring it uh, to, well, expose uh, as, an, as an application, expose itself as an application which can be used, and also adding roles to it, because you want to do roles. Now we want to authorize our application with roles. So let me show you. So this is enterprise application. We'll get back to this in a couple of uh, minutes. Also in a couple of minutes. Uh, let's first go to the app registration. So this is the same app registration as you saw in my slide deck. Uh, this is the overview. I've created this already. Nothing fancy configured to it. You can just go next, next, finish when, uh, when creating the app registration. Uh, there's uh, this, uh, what, what's it called? Uh, this part, so the, the redirect URI, you can fill out whatever you want over here. It's not used, or at least not for this scenario. So next, next, finish. So what you do need to do is go to the expose an API blade and create the application ID URI. So this is the application ID URI you need uh, to have in your calling application. So if you remember, I had some code where I got this application ID URI from the configuration and I've used this in Azure Service Token Provider in order to get an access token for this application. This is very important. So it's also not a big secret. This this URI, uh, you probably don't want to put it on on, uh, uh, on some public repo, but it's it's not very important. It's just some identifier for your application. So, and you probably notice I've also created a scope over here and added a client application. And this is because I like working locally and test stuff locally. And in order to do so, you have to add the client ID of Visual Studio to the authorized client applications. 
I have to confess, this took me longer as I wanted to figure out. Uh, as it happens, there's a GitHub issue on this, and on, uh, on, on, the, on this stuff, like a lot of people uh, are struggling with this or were, because now it's uh, visible on GitHub. But when using Visual Studio uh, to create an access token uh, for your application ID, URI, it sends a client ID in the request uh, or, or it uses this client ID. This is the Visual Studio client ID. And if this client ID isn't added to, to the authorized client applications, you will get some strange response, which doesn't make sense at all. It's about connection strings and not matching, uh, uh, not, spe not having specified the connection string, stuff like this. Luckily, when you Google for this, the GitHub issue is, well, in, at least in the top five list. Uh, the link is in, in my slide deck. I will make the slide deck public uh, later on. But it's something you need to know. And in order to add an authorized application, you also have to add a scope to your application. So I've added a scope for local development. It's just a dummy scope because I won't be using these scopes uh, in my application, or at least not at the moment. So that's, that's the exposed API part. Next up uh, is the manifest. So the manifest is, well, your app registration in JSON format. So you can find everything of your app registration over here and also edit it. So if I add a space, I can, or an N, I can save it if it's valid JSON. So as you can see, uh, so there's a lot of stuff going on over here, but the important part is the app roles part. Because I want to work with app roles in my application. Uh, in order to well authorize and uh, and uh, well to authenticate and authorize users for specific endpoints, users and applications. So you can add them manually. Uh, it's it's not very fancy. Um, the allowed member types is important. So for, if you only want to authenticate with managed identities, you can you just have to add application. Uh, if you also want users to connect to it, like me from my Visual Studio instance, you also have to add users to this. Otherwise, the user will not be able to connect to your service. To your, yeah, to your service. So the description, well, a nice description for the for the role. The display name. This display name will be shown uh, in in the the roles. Uh, the 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 role based uh, uh, in the ro roles blade of your enterprise enterprise application uh, identifier. So I'm using a GUID over here because it has to be unique. You can also think of some uh, some string, some number, whatever, or at least that's what I understood from the documentation. But as I'm always using a GUID because it's always unique. Yeah test this out. So it's enabled uh, origin and the value. The value is important to, to us developers because this value, uh, we're, we'll be using this inside our backend service uh, to add uh, the authorization, uh, to, yeah, to add the, the, the authorization uh, to our endpoints. So and the same goes for a uh, writer role. So I have a reader and a writer role. You can make, uh, well, dozens of roles in here, depending on what, how many you like or need. And that's uh, that's what you, this is the, well, the hardest part, or at least the, the most technical part from, well, my perspective. You have to add this JSON stuff and do it properly. So it's not hard, it's just something you need to know. 
So is there more I need to cover? I don't think so for now. So this is the app registration. Exposing an API. As I mentioned, uh, here's the GitHub repository. So it's uh, 6172 uh, of the Azure SDK for .NET. Uh, so if you're interested, it, it's a closed issue because there's a proper workaround. Uh, and if you're a fan of the Azure CLI, you also have to specify a different uh, client ID. Uh, so Visual Studio is the 872. Azure CLI has a different GUID, obviously, uh, which you have to add if you want to use the CLI to connect to your service. So we covered uh, the manifest already. I, I explained uh, the, the most important uh, properties. So there, there's that. And now we have this app registration done. So we're uh, done for the app registration in, uh, in the, uh, oh, my printer is turning on. That's interesting. Let's see what comes out. A blank sheet. So, but uh, now our app registration is configured and uh, set to go in the Azure Active Directory. Uh, what we need to do now is connect our, our backend service to this app registration because now we just have, uh, well, a clean app service inside our subscription uh, for the, the, the speaker API. And it doesn't have any clue on what the app registration is uh, which we uh, which we just created so we have to connect uh, to it in order to do this we have to type in some more uh, json so we have this uh, authority which is well the the default uh, authority that with the parent id of your application uh, we have of course the the client id which is the id of the the application id of your app registration and the application ID URI, which we also need in this uh, speaker API. You have to add uh, authentication and authorization to our solution and configure this in the configure services. So to make this a bit more clear, I've also opened up these files in Visual Studio. So we're in the Secure API Speaker uh, project, I've opened up the app settings. And what we have over here is the authentication uh, block. So I, I mean, this, this will probably be set via some uh, ARM template or via your user secrets uh, or just in here. All of this code is on GitHub, so I've, I'm using user secrets for myself. Uh, but if you're, well, doing in-company stuff, closed source stuff, you can also put the values over here because it won't bother anyone. So what do we have more? As I mentioned, we have to add use authentication and use authorization uh, in order to, well, add this. It's important to note you have to specify these in a specific order. So you first have to add use authentication and then use authorization. So when I was creating this, I had them like this, use authorization and use authentication, and it didn't work. I got the most strange errors and I couldn't make any sense of it until I found some Post, I think it was on Stack Overflow, stating, yeah, you have to turn the switch them around and it will work. I did this and magic happened. Everything worked. So that's all there is to it. If you heard something in the background, it's my daughter waking up. My wife is uh, getting her from bed. She still needs her afternoon sleep. She's, well, two and a half years old now. So that's great if she still sleeps. So, uh, other thing is, 
what we have to do in the configure services, we have to, or at least I want to add a policy uh, stating we need at least some JOT, some valid JOT token in the, in the, in the header. So uh, re require, well, a JOT token, the default policy, and use the, well, the default uh, JOT bearer token uh, scheme. And this is the authority and the valid audiences. So it's the stuff uh, we had configured in the app settings. This code can also be found on GitHub, like I mentioned. And now that we have this, so now our secure API dot speaker project is, uh, now that it's, well, connected to our app registration, we can also use the, the created app roles. So I have this weather forecast controller and I'm using the authorized attribute with a role secure API dot speaker dot reader. It's the role we just, well, created in our manifest. So this is great because now we can have some role based authorization inside our application without doing much stuff. So to let me go back to the deck. So what do we have now? We have one service, our front-end service, uh, which has a managed identity, and it's making an HTTP call to our back-end service with a, bear, uh, a, a valid bearer token inside the authorization header. And we also have a second service, the, the speaker uh, API service, uh, which has an app registration. We've added app roles to this, and we've well added the authorized attribute with a role to to a random uh, endpoint. It's not very random. I just did file new. Oh wow! What do we have? A new follower. Thank you, Mr. Robot. If I'm yes, thank you. Thank you for follow. Hello, appreciate it. So what do we do we have now? We have uh, the app roles in the app registration, which we configured in the manifest. And we've configured uh, the authentication in the service, so it's connected with each other. So next up is, uh, well, granting these, these roles to, well, identities, because we have the service one with an identity, and we have the service two, which has authorization assigned to it, but no identity, no application has access, has been granted a role, uh, has been granted a role. So in order to do this, uh, there's some uh, REST commands you can use, so if you make a post to the to the, the graph API. Uh, there's an endpoint you can use to do some app role assignments and you have to specify which app role you want to uh, assign to which principle, what's the principle type and the resource ID. So and as you probably see in the comments uh, I've added to this script, you have to use the identifier of the enterprise application. So whenever you're creating an app registration, you get a new enterprise application with the same name for free. So let's head, let's head to this uh, uh, enterprise application. I think I had it open. Yeah, so this is the enterprise application with the secure API speakers. It's it's named the same, has the same name, and it has, of course, the application ID, object ID, stuff like this. And this object ID, if I'm not mistaken, is the most important part. Let me go back to the slide deck. So 91B, yes, 91B is the one we need. So you have to specify to which instance of the uh, enterprise application you want to assign roles to. And that can be done via this, this uh, script. I also opened it up in 
uh, in code. So you should probably notice there's this URI which has the object ID of my uh, enterprise application. So this is telling the, the graph API go to this enterprise application and do some app role assignments uh, on it. And over here, this is the enterprise application which you're granting uh, well, a role to a specific uh, principle. So this principal ID is the object ID of my managed identity. And this app role ID is the unique identifier we created for our specific role. So over here, I've added the reader role to my managed identity. So I, as I already mentioned, I like developing from my local machine with my own identity. I also need to add this reader role and maybe the writer role uh, to uh, my, my identity. So what I did is doing the same uh, command just now with my object ID from my user and specifying the principal type is a user. So as you see, the principal type of your managed identity is a service principal because it's, well, somewhat of an application. It's not a user. And I am a user in my tenant, so I have to specify the user over here. But you can also see this in the Azure portal. Let me go back to it. Every time I do Windows tab, or a lot of the times, it's kind of random, the explorer that actually crashes. I don't know if this is a new uh, feature. It's rather annoying. So what you will be able to see over here, let me find it, permissions. Um, I thought I had it already open. Um, in a different tab, perhaps. Over here, over here. So API permissions, no. Uh, kind of our uh, users and groups, obviously. So uh, as you can see over here, uh, the managed identity has been added to, uh, which has a role, speaker service reader which is a description we uh, we used in the app roles. And we have this user, Jan de Vries, which also has a speaker service reader. So that's, that's great. So now we should be able to invoke this service. And that's exactly what we're gonna do uh, after this note, because in real life, you probably in a production environment, you probably don't want to manage users or service principles or stuff like this. You probably want to work with security groups like you've pro done well for ages now with the on-premises Active Directory and probably also in the Azure Active Directory. In order to do this, you have to have Azure AD Premium, so either P1 or P2. Uh, in order to work with security groups and granting roles to this. So I, I'm in my, my own tenant, uh, which is the, the free uh, Azure AD. And so I can't use this feature. I can't grant roles to security groups inside my AD. So that's a shame. So I have to well, specify every user myself or every man's identity myself to a specific role. But if you're using a proper AAD instance, uh, and I guess most companies are using a P1, maybe a P2, uh, you will be able to use groups for this. So keep that in mind. So also, if you have any questions, just ask them in the chat. Uh, I will address them uh, as soon as I get a chance. <coughs> so, but uh, what did I want to show? Right, I want to show you the 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 loop. So we have this authorized attribute on the 
endpoints weather forecast get in the weather forecast controller. We have this API, this, this front end API, uh, which is making a well authentic uh, access token for uh, this identity and it makes a request to our backend API, so the speaker API URI. We get these from the from the configuration. So I've deployed this to Azure already. So I have this app service secure API and have the speakers and when navigating to uh, the endpoint, the, the weather forecast endpoint over here, I will be able to see well, the response. So this is the response I got from my backend API. It's well, the weather forecast. And this is the access token uh, created from, for my uh, managed identity. And it's a uh, 200 OK. So let's see. This is, well, as you can see, a lot of stuff, but you can, uh, the most important part, or at least for now, is the, uh, we got the role, secureapi.speaker.reader. So the identity has this role, which is nice. So that's, uh, that's it for today. If you want to do some more reading on the matter, um, go to my blog uh, where I'll be posting a blog on, on, on this, um, a nice post, which will summarize everything and you can read it. The code is on GitHub. It's in the secure API uh, repo. And if you have any questions later on, uh, hit me up on, uh, on uh, well, on Twitter, ask a question on, tw on this Twitch channel, or uh, do, uh, send me an email. Uh, most of the time I'm able to respond quite quickly. So oh, thank you all uh, for now. That's it. And if there aren't any further questions, I will be uh, I will be closing the stream in uh, in a couple of minutes. So uh, thank you all. Thank you, uh, Abakan.